We're back with our keynote panel session uh, panelists and our keynote speaker to talk about how we responded to COVID-19 and how we relearned the significance of care and gender equality through the process. We are very honored to invite Nancy Fulgray, Professor Emerita of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, also former president of the International Association for Feminist Economics to give us her keynote speech to start off our conference. Thank you so much. It's a great honor and privilege to be giving a plenary message to kick off the conference. And uh, let me just share my screen. The title of my presentation is The Care Economy in Korea Beyond COVID-19 and Towards a Sustainable Caring Society. There has been a great deal of discussion in the business press in the United States about uh, Korean care policies. In a recent article in Bloomberg Markets, the theme was South Korea crosses a population Rubicon and warning to the world. Half the global population now lives in countries with below replacement fertility. The resulting stresses and strains along with the COVID pandemic are leading us to a new understanding of economic development. A big part of this new understanding involves the care economy. So let's begin by asking what we mean by that term. What is the care economy? Sometimes it's referred to as the care sector of the economy. It basically encompasses activities that produce, develop and maintain human capabilities. It includes both paid work, childcare, elder care, healthcare, education, social services. And it also includes the unpaid work provided by family and community members. Care provision has several distinctive features. It's motivated by obligation, by responsibility, affection, and altruism, as well as economic self-interest. It has more to do with transfers to dependence rather than voluntary exchange between adults. In that sense, it doesn't really fit into the traditional textbook version of economic theory. The characteristics of care provision make it difficult to individually capture value added. And care creates many positive spillovers, many unanticipated consequences, almost always positive consequences. Many people benefit when the health, the education, um, the general capabilities of the population are improved, enhanced, or maintained. Because of these distinctive features, care provision is seldom efficiently produced by capitalist enterprises, although under some conditions it can be. We have seen in over the long haul very significant global changes in the care economy. For most of the 20th century, rapid population growth unfolded due to very high fertility combined with improvements in health that led to mortality decline. Even at the end of the 20th century, this process was coming to an end. And now in the 21st century, we're experiencing very rapid fertility decline to below replacement levels, particularly in countries that have experienced uh, dramatic growth in gross domestic product or GDP, as is the case in Korea. This global demographic change has been neglected and misunderstood by conventional economic theory. And what's missing from the traditional, the conventional picture is attention to the interaction between patriarchal institutions and capitalist institutions uh, an interaction that's mediated by both global trends and national cultures. If, you, if we look back into the far distant past, kind of uh, really ancient history, uh, we see that high mortality once made high fertility very necessary for economic and military success, especially on the national level. Uh, patriarchal institutions 
forced women to specialize in care provision, ensuring a cheap supply of family labor and rewarding high fertility. Capitalist development and technological change reduced the advantages of high fertility and destabilized many of the patriarchal institutions that limited women's choices. The institutional change that's unfolded has led to new forms of distributional conflict over what's sometimes termed the costs of social reproduction, the cost of reproducing ourselves as a society and as a species. And this distributional conflict is shaping the policies of the welfare state, which redistributes more money now between generations than it does between different classes with particularly significant consequences for women who continue to do a disproportionate share of all uh, care provision. So a major contradiction of the current welfare state, uh, not just in Korea, but in many, many countries is that the benefits of raising children have been socialized uh, by taxing the working age population to support the health and retirement of the elderly. This is a, a historical process that I describe in more detail in my uh, recent book, The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, an Intersectional Political Economy. And you can go there to see, get a little bit more of the details and texture of the story that I'm laying out. But to come to the present, now states um, all around the globe and especially Korea have begun to socialize more of the cost of children providing greater public subsidies. And um, as you know, Korean policymakers have become uh, quite proactive in recent years in terms of uh, increasing childcare provision uh, and providing support for family leaves and uh, elder care. However, they've underestimated the actual costs and also women's willingness to voluntarily continue to pay these costs. And this is an issue that has really deep roots in the very nature of care provision. Specialization in providing care will always be economically disadvantageous because it's difficult to individually capture any economic benefits. The, the product that's being produced, which is human capabilities, is not for sale. Um, as a result, responsibilities for care provision have to be equitably shared through achievement of a better balance between family work and paid work. So what do we do now? Well, here's my summary. Below replacement fertility will not have terrible consequences we can and we will adapt to it, although it will be a stressful and difficult process. As global and national populations decline, however, we must learn how to stabilize them in the future. And this is going to require a fundamental reorientation of priorities away from emphasis on the growth of gross domestic product and the market economy. It will require recognition of the intrinsic and also the extrinsic value of producing, developing, and maintaining human capabilities in an ecologically sustainable process of economic growth. Among the many lessons of COVID-19 are these. Economic growth itself does not deliver health and well-being. Spending on children and parents is not a bribe or a waste or a form of unproductive spending, it's the most important investment we can make as a society. Likewise, spending on a large elderly population is not a burden or a source of unproductive spending. It too is an investment, an investment in our own hopes for longevity, health, and reduced depreciation of human capital. Thank you, Korea. The rapidity of your demographic change is forcing you to play a leadership role in a global process of adaptation to a new economic regime, a new economic world. I believe that the research being presented at this conference will contribute greatly to your success. Thank you so much for your attention. Goodbye. <laughs>